Welcome to the 150th episode of Classical Classroom. Hey everybody, it's your host, Aisha. Uh, I honestly cannot believe that we've made this many, and I still barely know anything about classical music. <laughs> In this episode with violinist and would-be comedian Jennifer Coe, I try yet again to learn, uh, this time about Tchaikovsky. Speaking of me learning, some of you will be glad to know that we have a new show intro. Uh, we'd love to hear what you think, so please email me your thoughts at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org or tweet your thoughts to us. We're at CC Shows on Twitter. Don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. And uh, just one moment of sincerity. Thank you so much for doing that and for listening to us. You guys are the reason that we make this show. Enjoy the episode. There's a rumor going around that classical music can be hoity-toity. But here in the classical classroom, we beg to differ. Beethoven 5. <laughs> Isaiah is shaking with excitement oh, here. I mean, there's just so many great parts of the opera. He asked me to play his favorite spot in the first moon of the Brahms. And then he said, I started using those licks in my guitar solos. How to be classical music rock stars because there's not enough of that in this business. Occasionally I would plug in the mandolin to my distortion pedals. <laughs> I don't change my voice. And talking to classical I, music voice. <laughs> I'm playing classical music now. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the same 12 notes. That's what's so cool about it. I'm Desha Clay, a classical music newbie, and I'm trying to learn all I can about the music. Come learn with me and the classical music experts I invite into the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classical Classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and joining me from Dubway Studios in New York City is Jennifer Coe. Jennifer is a violinist. She's Musical America's Instrumentalist of the Year for 2016. She's known for collaborating with artists across disciplines, and though she's played with leading orchestras all over the world, she's also all about education and has played in classrooms across the country. She just put out a new album of Tchaikovsky's Complete Works for Violin and Orchestra. Jennifer Coe, welcome to the Classical Classroom. Hi, thanks for having me. So you have had a long relationship with the works of Tchaikovsky. Tell me a little bit about your personal relationship with uh, his pieces. So I remember very clearly the Tchaikovsky concerto was something I really wanted to play. And it's the first time I actually was begging my teacher to let me learn that piece, the Tchaikovsky concerto. And I think I must have been 14. Wow. And then I started performing it, I think, probably when I was around 15 years old. I went to Russia for the first time, which at the time was, like, incredibly thrilling for me because I, I was really obsessed with everything Russian, like literature, history. Really? Um, political thought. Well, why? I just why? Like, what, drew, what drew you to it? Um... I don't know. You know, they have these things. You know what they say with literature that, like, German novels and German writing is like the hedgehog and, and French writing is like the fox because uh -huh. it just moves in different uh, tempi. Like, you'll you'll see, like, music, you know, uh, Magic Mountain. It's like, I don't know, 800 pages. Uh -huh. And it's really like this ruminations you're on the top and, and you're kind of like losing perspective of time but it's like a huge tome yeah. um and and then if you like compare it with like Stendhal or something with like red and black mm -hmm. um the just the pace of the writing is different and mm -hmm. for some reason for me um i just uh, with russian literature it's almost like there it's in the middle uh -huh. And I think it's you can kind of make these weird. I mean, I'm making like massive stereotypes, and so this is a massive stereotype. But I think it's very similar in the music too, because yeah. German Germanic music tends to be very dense. There's like more of a lightness with French music. This is like really stereotyping, and then Russian music is kind of in the middle of that. Hmm. For some reason, I was like really obsessed with Tolstoy. Um, not mm. the moralistic stuff so much, mm -hmm. but I loved um, Anna Karenina. Yeah. There was also writers, like I was really into Mandelstam, mm -hmm. uh, for, for poets I mean, Mandelstam and Anna Akhmatova, mm -hmm. and also Dostoevsky, oh. and then some of the like satirists I was yeah. also really into. And what, what were your feelings on Pushkin? 
Did you like the Pushkin? Pushkin? Yeah. I liked Pushkin. I mean, I guess that was the beginning point. I I think I liked the darkness of later writers as well. I know yeah. he was very he's considered really very much like the beginning. Uh-huh. And then like in terms of political writing, I just found Lenin funny. I somebody I hope I don't get like assassinated for saying that. But um <laughs> because he was so angry and I think like everything he wrote has like exclamation points on it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, so I just and and Russian history I also found fascinating. So yeah, yeah, I, I I'm I'm right there with you on the Dostoevsky and that sort of weird. It's it's this very sort of um, sort of tinged with darkness and romance at the same time. Yes. I, yeah, I, I, and it's like this very particular combination, and everything is. You just imagine that everybody is wearing like fur coats all the time. <laughs> And <laughs> well, it is really freaking cold there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm in the winter, and, and so you kind of like, and this as a young musician, you were drawn to the 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 music as well, like for those same reasons. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think when I was a kid, anyhow, I you know I read all the time. I, yeah. I mean, everything I seemed to have liked was like very solitary, which I'm sure. It must say something about who I am as a person, but you know, I love swimming, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I loved reading, and I love music, and they're all pretty solitary activities, actually. Yeah. But I think I think the whole point of of art in general, whether it's literature or visual arts or theater or dance or music, is that it really helps you come to a place of understanding of of where you fit in the world, yeah. other people's uh, experiences, how you relate to that experience. I think what I love about music in particular is that it brings people to an emotional place that they would not necessarily access on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Like if you're just going to work, you know, you're not necessarily <laughs> encountering, you know, incredible, like, elation and joy and <laughs> right. but also you know maybe tragedy and i think that's what literature also does that it it can really draw you in into a character so that you empathize with an experience totally different from your own yeah. and so i think for me it was just uh it would just felt like a natural extension yeah and so this is the point at which you met tchaikovsky and and you were like yeah that's, that's just <laughs> <guess> right. So, <laughs> so I, before we kind of go into a little more to your relationship as a violinist to the music of Tchaikovsky, could you just tell us a little bit about about him as a person? Um, <laughs> you know, he was born. <laughs> he was born I know at he a was time. Born in Russia. <laughs> I mean, I can say musically, you know, I think he was very influenced by Mozart. Uh What I know about Russian history is that there was a certain class of intelligentsia who were very linked to Europe Uh um, and to France and to European culture. So he would have had, as a musician, he would have had a lot of exposure to what was happening throughout Europe, musically. And so I do know that historically. And I know he must have suffered an incredible amount in his life um, Mm -hmm. as a gay man in in that time period. I think he kind of forced himself into a marriage. And this was around the time that he was writing the violin music, I think, was in the aftermath of that. It was kind of a disastrous... Oh, after uh, his and, his marriage to the, the woman? I can't remember her yeah, name. Yeah, and I think it was a very incredibly short marriage. It was kind of disastrous. Yeah. And he attempted suicide shortly after. And I know that the violin music that he's written is all within that time frame. Interesting. So when I, when I read a little bit about this album that you've put out, mm-hmm. some of the pieces were described as, quote... Some of the most daunting in the violin repertoire. So that seems like fun to play. <laughs> I think we should hear one of these incredibly daunting pieces. Do you want to introduce one? We'll, we'll play one from your new album. 
Well, the first piece is not daunting. Technically, <laughs> it's incredibly haunting and beautiful. Yeah. Um, I guess the second piece, False Scherzo, is a little tricky. The last movement of the Tchaikovsky Concerto. Yeah. So maybe like I would think like thirty seconds into the third movement of the Tchaikovsky Concerto. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I hate listening to myself. Really? Oh, God, it's awful. Why? It's torture. Why? Because I, I, so I just want to change everything. Listen to you. <laughs> Sound like me listening to my voice recorded. So... So yeah. talk to me about what's happening in the music here. Like, what what uh, what makes this so particularly daunting? I mean, to me, as a non-violinist, I'm listening to this, wondering how on earth anyone could possibly play this. But can, well, <laughs> can if you, you tell listen, me why I'm thinking that? You can hear that, like, there's a shift from low to yeah. high yeah. to extremely high. So on the violin, that literally means that I'm I'm traveling, like or leaping a lot, uh-huh. and you, you can also hear that the tempo is fast. Yeah. So between all of those notes, I'm like moving up and down the instrument, uh, up and down the neck of the instrument. Gotcha. I mean, I guess it's like maybe a s- six inches, uh-huh. uh, but when you're, you know, in terms of precision, it's like literally paper thin mm-hmm. uh, in order to play in tune, which is like an essential part of mm-hmm. being a violinist and something we struggle with all the time. So you can imagine that there's all of that moving around very quickly Mm -hmm. uh, can be, I guess, daunting. Yeah. So now why, as a violinist, would you want to play something that's so daunting? Because it's super fun. (laughs) (laughs) It's so fun. (laughs) I mean, whenever in a performance, whenever I get to this movement, I'm just like, ah, this is, it's super fun. Because you go through like this whole, like, you know, the first movement is quite dark and, mm-hmm. and like really like dramatic. And so you kind of go through this whole uh, kind of emo- emotional process. And then the last movement is like fun. And then for me, it's actually fun with the orchestra because you can hear that like between all of my notes, you can kind of hear like the orchestra is always on the offbeat, uh-huh. which basically means it's not like on. Um, one of my friends said this funniest thing in a, a show she did, and she was like, "Friends don't let friends clap on downbeats or, or on strong beats." <laughs> <laughs> so, but basically, when I say it, it's like syncopated, um, and so it's always oh. off the beat, so it's not on strong beats. Interesting. Um, so it's actually hard to coordinate, uh-huh. but it actually makes it fun because it's like. I don't know. For me, it's really fun because you can kind of see the conductor is like, ah, what tempo is she going to take? And then all of the strings are on the offbeat, uh-huh. and I'm I'm going pretty fast, so it's like they have to react very quickly, and it's like this kind of fun challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so you're setting the pace, and you're like, all right, here we go. Yeah, yeah. And like they don't really know if I'm going to go 90 miles an hour or like. 180. I mean, they kind of know the framework. Like, I'm not suddenly going to be, like, slow or... Yeah. So that's really fun. Yeah. And then, I I don't know, at the end of the last movement, I like doing this slight cello rondo, which means a slight speeding up. Okay. And that's also fun because everybody's still on the off feet. (laughs) And, yeah, but it's fun, actually. I'm not sure if you're a benevolent leader or not. I can't tell. I think you're, you, you. Get- I think in the at, at least in this movement, I think I'm a playful partner. Okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't really call myself a leader, but it's like a, a playful partnership. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you're taunting the entire orchestra. Is what you're doing? No, no, it's not <laughs> taunting at all. It's not taunting. It's more. It's more like I don't. I'm super not athletic in terms of balls and stuff. Like uh-huh. I can't catch anything. Um, <laughs> but it, it's kind of like what I imagine people do when they, you know, play baseball. When they or when they do sportsing. Well, like I yeah. I remember like sometimes they try to do these like amateur 
like they would put me on like a softball team uh-huh. like you know like the chamber musicians versus this group or something uh-huh. and they would always of course put me like I don't even know what is called you know far out where people like throw the you know when it's like I think that's the outfield I think that's like what that. it's called <laughs> <laughs> and I remember and they give they gave me a mitt and you know, two hours into the game, like a ball is heading towards my way. And they were like, Jenny, catch it. Jenny, catch it. Run towards it. <laughs> and then at the end, and I was like, I think I have it. I think I have And then I just put the mitt on top of my head because I was afraid of getting hit. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I completely failed them. This is fantastic. <laughs> so Jennifer Co, great at violin, not so much at softball. Horrible at softball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a... And then also I couldn't like ever get the ball to meet the bat. I, I don't know. <laughs> so they actually started trying to throw it like at my bat and I still couldn't hit it. Wow. No. Okay. Well, maybe stick with the violin. <laughs> yeah. Although some of my friends say I should actually go to a ball game, which I'm uh-huh. very curious to do because like I love watching soccer, but like I should go to baseball. I, j- I think I just don't understand what's happening. Yeah. So I've never, but they said I should actually go to a baseball game Uh and then somebody should explain like what's happening. And then they said there's like this great art to it. And actually there was this amazing book, The Art of Fielding. Ah. It was a great novel. So I thought maybe, and he was a shortstop, Uh the main character. So I thought maybe I would learn, but I really didn't learn about the actual game in that book. (laughs) (laughs) He learned about the story. The game was at the yes. center. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I feel like we should go back to Tchaikovsky because I only have like five <laughs> more minutes with you. <laughs> and we're supposed to be talking about Tchaikovsky. There's um, also a great book about what is that thing with the sticks that they play in England and India? Oh. Do you know that ball game? Are you talking about croquet? Cricket. Yes. Cricket. 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 Yeah. And so there's a great book called The Netherlands. Uh-huh. Um, I think the author's last name is O'Neill, and it's based in New York City uh-huh. amongst immigrants in New York. And so I think I learned a little bit about cricket, that's, but not really. That's way more than I know. I know okay. zero about cricket except for that it is a sport. That's That's the end of my knowledge. Okay, so my question to you, back to the music, is why did Tchaikovsky hate violinists? Why would he write music this difficult? Oh, I don't think that's out of a hatred. I think. But what is that? Like, where does that come from? Why would a composer write something? I think it's out of an expressive need. Okay. And I think what's amazing to me about composers and being in music in general, we're always trying to reach a point beyond ourselves, Uh right? And I think it's just simply a form of expression, and that the only way that he could that composers can say what they're trying to say is through, I think especially in the case of Tchaikovsky, was the way that he wrote it. Uh So there was just no other way to express what he needed to say. I think that's probably just out of a dedication to, to, to the music itself. I see. And I kind of appreciate it in a strange way because it's completely just dedicated to what he wanted to say as a composer. Uh And he wasn't worried about just making it just making his colleagues at the time happy so yeah. that would be easy to learn, you know? Yeah. Uh, he was actually dedicated to the art of what he was doing. I see. I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, I, I mean, I can say as a performer that there's always different pressures that are happening going into a premiere. Mm-hmm. And I think it took a lot for him probably. And I, I've also seen, well, I'm part of this too, because we, like, musicians all get reviewed so I know that it can be incredibly devastating to composers Mm -hmm. so in a way I I have a lot of empathy for him uh, because he really stuck with his vision yeah even though he was kind of dismissed at the time that these pieces were dismissed and and I know (laughs) even myself from my own experience that it's that's not easy yeah to go through that experience and then to still stand by yeah to still stick with it yeah. Aside from that, there's also, you know, I think musicians and artists always have to analyze what you're doing. So yeah. there's always in the mix, there's self-doubt. And the fact that his vision was so strong that he just continued going that way, even though the people around him were saying that it's unplayable, it's blah, blah, blah. And he was right, because it is playable. Yeah, it just with a lot of practice. Um, I guess my last question is, 
Can you compare like Tchaikovsky's difficult pieces with difficult pieces in the violin repertoire by other composers? Like who kind of stands with him in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that reputation for Tchaikovsky came from that time period uh, because Leopold Auer, who was uh, the teacher of like some of the greatest violinists in the 20th, beginning of the 20th century, which was like Yasha Heifetz, uh, Misha Elman, he declared the concerto unplayable. So I think that's where that kind of myth came from. I can certainly tell you I've played like way, at least for me personally, like things that were much harder <laughs> yeah <laughs> that or at least felt much harder i think for when i first like learned the lakey violin concerto and he's a hungarian composer he died maybe about 10 years ago mm-hmm. and that felt like i was like trying to crawl up a wall wow <laughs> and every day and it was the same thing every day i would like practice for like eight hours trying to and it's so densely like orchestrated which means there's so much stuff going on and it's so technically difficult also. And so I would spend like eight hours like just practicing that. And then the next day I'd like look back at the same – and we're not even – like I would get through like a page. Uh-huh. And then I would go back to that same page and it was like as though I'd never seen it before. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was hard. <laughs> okay, so even though Tchaikovsky is difficult, there's more difficult stuff out there. Oh, yeah. Jennifer Ko, this has been so much fun. I wish you didn't have to go. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everybody, that does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. Find our social media links there, if you dare. Email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Subscribe to us, rate us, and review us on iTunes, because if we get to number one on the music podcast charts, we'll send each and every reviewer a new car. No, we will not do that, but we will say thank you really hard. <clears throat> Thanks today to audio producer Todd Birthday Boy Hulslander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing mirror ball eyes. Thanks to Jennifer Coe for being here today and to engineer Adrian Thorstenson at Dubway Studios for helping today. Thanks to me for saying words, but most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>